very excited to have Dimitri Tomasco here um, to, to present this lecture on um, part of the transdisciplinary program here at CGU. Um, we've been working with this book in the course that Professor Van Dusen and I are teaching um, this semester in the transdisciplinary program. My name is Jody Rockwell, and I teach at Pomona College um, and here for the semester. Um, Dimitri, uh, like I said, we're very excited to have him. Uh, He's currently a professor of music at Princeton, uh, where he's been teaching composition and theory since 2002. Um, he studied music and philosophy at Harvard and was awarded a Rhodes Scholar for <coughs> his graduate work in philosophy at Oxford. He received his PhD in music composition from the University of California, Berkeley. His music has won numerous prizes and awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Charles Ives Scholarship from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, two Hugh McCall Prizes from Harvard University, and the Eisner and De Lorenzo Prizes from the University of California, Berkeley. He's received fellowships from Tanglewood, the Ernst Block Festival, the Mass Institute for Advanced Studies of Music Theory, and was a composer in residence at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. He was awarded a bicentennial preceptorship from Princeton and has been the Block Lecturer at the Society for, of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. He's published one book with Oxford University Press, The Geometry of Music, which uh, many of us have, have read from, uh, and two CDs with bridge records um, entitled Crackpot Hymnal for Classical Instruments and Beat Therapy for Jazz Funk Ensemble. His articles have appeared in the American Mathematical Monthly, The Atlantic, uh, help me with the pronunciation, Berfois. Oh, uh, yeah, I actually don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Boston Review, Civilization, Integral, Journal of Music Theory, Lingua Franca, Music Analysis, Music Theory Online. Music Theory Spectrum, Science, Scene, and Transition. His article, The Geometry of Musical Chords, was the first music theory article published in the 130-year history of Science Magazine. Articles about his work have appeared in a variety of newspapers and magazines, including Time, Nature, and Physics Today. So please welcome Dimitri Tosco. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to have to shorten the, the vinyl on my website. I shorten the vinyl. So yeah, this, this, uh, this is going to be a little bit of an informal talk. Um, it's going to go over some ground that the people who are in the class and have been reading my book uh, will have seen before, but hopefully from a slightly different angle. And I'm going to try to leave time for questions. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so the basic topic is vectors and voice theory. One of these terms is a mathematical term. One of them is a music theoretical term. And so I'm going to talk about uh, how they end up weaving together. Okay. And um, I'm going to start with the fact that PowerPoint uh, doesn't work very well. Let's try this. Okay. Informal music talk includes a number of terms that you can think of as referring to musical objects, which we can understand metaphorically as points in some kind of abstract space of possibilities. And these include note, chord, chord type, like major chord. Um, and these, like I said, are associated with points, single places you can be. We also have a number of terms like interval, chord progression, voice leading, which are ways of getting from one point to another, and we can associate these with arrows or with vectors in some, again, metaphorical sense. If you're talking about an interval like a major third, that's not a single point. That's a, a way of getting from one place to another place. And in some cases, it's really obvious how to make the connection between this music talk and this metaphor of points and vectors. Um, so if we're talking about a note like middle C, and another note like the E above it. Uh, the arrow connecting them can be associated with the musical term and ascending major third. And everything works out mathematically the way you would expect it to. Essentially, what we're talking about is, is what mathematicians call one-dimensional real affine space. And there are no difficulties connecting the mathematical language and the musical language. On the other hand, there are a lot of cases where it's just really hard to make the connection. Musicians talk all, of, all the time about voice leadings, and there are, you know, there are tons of remarks about voice leading in elementary theory textbooks, 
Um, and we would like to think of a voice leading as a way of getting from one musical place to another musical place, but it's just not at all obvious what the relevant points are or what the relevant space is or how to make this picture rigorous in the way that it's really easy to do for intervals. So now I'm going to switch to a bit of history. I will say that in the decades before I started um, thinking about this stuff, music theorists worked really hard to come up with a formal theory of musical vectors, a kind of general language for talking about arrows in a musical context. Uh, in my opinion, these efforts really had only limited success for reasons that are kind of interesting if you're thinking about interdisciplinarity or trying to bridge one world uh, to another. One reason that these efforts didn't have a huge amount of success is the theorists who were thinking about vectors, or as they often called them, transformations, they did not try to explain which vectors were fundamental or particularly important to the kinds of musical activities we typically engage in. And this was for reasons of philosophy. My teacher, a very influential, uh, influential theorist named David Lewin, he had a mathematical taste for abstraction and a philosophical kind of laissez-faire attitude, uh, which I think in his case was associated with the anti-authoritarianism of the 1960s. And so he tried to theorize in a way that was deeply neutral about what vectors might be. And this is mathematically maybe something uh, that you see in the, in the discipline of category theory, though even there, I think that connection, I'm, I'm not so comfortable with that. So David Lewin wanted to theorize about vectors in general rather than shining a spotlight on a particular class of vectors that uh, we could begin with and that he could make the case for this new way of thinking and, and uh, he could argue were particularly important. The idea of sort of focusing on one way to think about music was really an anathema to him. Um, interestingly enough, Lewin ended up promulgating formal tools that actually, in my opinion, uh, prevented people from adequately formalizing a central class of musical vectors, the concept of voice theory. So there's this kind of paradox where, on the one hand, he wanted to remain <coughs> very neutral about what vectors were, but on the other hand, he ended up imposing a kind of mathematical structure on vectors that prevented people from, from making progress on exactly this problem. And so, uh, let me just give you an example of this. Um, one of the most basic music theoretical acts is to ignore octaves. So, instead of talking about this particular C, middle C, or this note, an octave above middle C, or that one, or that one, or that one, people talk about C in general. And instead of talking about the line of all possible pitches, they talk about the circular space of the kinds of pitches, the types of pitches, that we get when we ignore octaves. Now, it's a really interesting fact that traditional music theory recognized only one way in which you could move from one point on the circle to another. So, for instance, if you were at C, and you were moving to E, there was, in the traditional way of thinking about these things, no fundamental question to be asked about how you got from this point on the circle to this point on the circle. You simply were there, and then something happened, and then you reappeared there. Now, I really wish I could make my keys go here. Uh, so, there was a kind of instantaneous teleportation. And it was actually thought to be a category mistake, a sign of fundamental confusion to ask the question, well, did this point on the circle move up to that point, or did it move this way, counterclockwise? That was, that was something to be pitied if it was being asked, rather than a question to be genuinely answered. Now, this is really interesting, because this question, how did the note C move to E? Whatever octave it's in, did it move up like this? Or did it move down in whatever octave? Or did it move up like this? This question is actually a perfectly well-formed, perfectly meaningful question. 
There is absolutely nothing confused about it. And the kind of interesting question from the standpoint of history is how did it come to seem to very intelligent people that this question itself was out of bounds or meaningless or confused? And here we get into some, I, I have only speculations about this, but I did look through it. And I think that one answer that I find interesting is that the people who found in modern American music theory were almost all composers of a very particular kind of atonal music called 12-tone music. And 12-tone music is almost unique among musical styles in the extent to which it asks us to ignore uh, octave relationships. So 12-tone music is many of you I don't know this, a few of you may not, is founded on an ordering of all the possible kinds of notes. And the rules of 12-tone music allow you to take this ordering and project it in any set of order, in, in any octave. And we're supposed to hear all of these different musical passages, or or as versions of the same fundamental melodic structure. And this is really, 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 really unusual, because in normal music, you can take a melodic passage like, and you can move it up or down, or you can transpose it. But you really cannot go That is not the same melody. That is not the kind of transformation that we customarily accept in melody. So what's kind of interesting is that the theorists who were building the basic architecture of music theory were actually coming from a very unusual perspective, but they did not themselves recognize how unusual that perspective is. And the intellectual tools they developed were originally designed for 12-tone music, which is totally fine. And then they got exported as general tools for thinking about a much wider range of music. And in that process, some of the particularity, instead of generalizing away and realizing we need to change the tools if we're changing the object of study, they did not do that. Another just sort of interesting fact is that the theorists who founded uh, modern American music theory just happened to be most comfortable with discrete mathematics and in particular group theory. Um, not, that most, not that much exposure to geometry. They were not that comfortable representing the pitch class circle. Oh, they were most comfortable representing the pitch class circle as a mathematical group rather than, say, a geometrical manifold. Uh, this again is one of those interesting, um, there's an interesting moral for interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity here, which is that if you're going into another field, it may be, especially if you're going into a gigantic field like mathematics, you have to be very careful that your own entry into that field doesn't limit you in, in ways that you might not even realize. Okay, so at a certain point in my life, I realized that I had to go back to the drawing board and that this inherited notion of pitch class interval was just not sufficient for what I wanted to talk about. And so I started talking about a path in pitch class space, which is a way of moving from one point of the circle, or note, when we're ignoring octaves, to another. And the idea here is to be able to formalize the thought that G, whatever octave it's in, moves up by eight semitones to E flat, Right? Or, and to make that be a different thing from G, whatever octave it's in, moves down by four semitones to E flat. So that I could say that one of these, but not the other, is the fundamental sort of motive of the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth <coughs> Symphony. Right? It's this one, and it happens in any octave. It's not that one. That's a different thing. Okay? So it turns out that this concept of talking about how one point on the circle moves to another point on the circle, this concept can be represented very naturally by the mathematical concept of a vector in the tangent space of the circle. And in the musical applications we're interested in, most of the time, we can associate these vectors uh, with paths through pitch class spaces if you were literally gliding from one point uh, in musical space 
to another. But, um, and in my book, I really focus on this paths representation of, of what, of, uh, what <clears throat> I'm talking about. But from a mathematical point of view, I would say that the concept of vector is the most familiar one. For, so for people who are mathematicians, or if you ever want to talk to mathematicians about some of these ideas, I have found that it's actually much more useful to talk about uh, vectors in the tangent space because that is such an elementary mathematical concept <clears throat> that people kind of immediately uh, understand it. So here is how that looks. The idea is that at this point G, we have a whole infinite continuum of possibilities that could be represented by the real numbers. The positive numbers represent moving up by some specific distance. The negative numbers represent moving down by some specific dif distance. Because music is a relatively simple application, we can associate <coughs> one of these vectors, like up eight, with an actual moving by eight semitones on the pitch glass circle and similarly. So there's a, a, a mapping between these vectors and these paths in the circle, in the circular space. And uh, that mapping is not always available mathematically, which is why it's probably sort of most useful to stick with this upper picture of vectors in the space. Now that, once we have this, once we have gone back and redefined one of the most essential and foundational concepts of music theory, it is possible to generalize that and define what I call a voice theory. A voice leading is just a collection or a multi-set of these paths in pitch class space. It, show, it shows how the notes of one chord move to the notes of another. It can be captured by simple English language statements like C major moves to F major by keeping the root note constant, moving the third up by semitone, and moving the fifth up by two semitones. And these motions can happen in any octave, so you can have, you could exemplify that voice either like this, or like this, or like this. And you can think of these as basic conceptual templates, which musicians, composers, performers, all learn as ways of getting from one chord to another. And my son is six years old, he's seven now, and he's learning to play piano. And in fact, one of the things that his teacher has him do is get these patterns in his fingers by playing them in every key so that when he encounters them in an actual piece of music, they're already there. So you can actually find all sorts of evidence for these templates all over sort of musical culture. Uh, in order to represent them, you, it just happens that you have to go back and rethink what a, um, uh, what a pitch class interval is. And in the book, I represent them with this vector-like notation here. I say C, E, G. C moves to C by a path of 0. E moves to F by a path of 1. G moves to A by an ascending path of 2. When these numbers lie in the range from 0 up to 6, I just leave them out to sort of simplify the notation. So I write that and uh, the arrow. The numbers are implicit. <coughs> so, just a little aside, when I first started talking about this, I would say for about 10 years, from maybe 2002 to 2012, every single paper I wrote where I explained this idea was rejected by at least one reader who said this is an incoherent way of talking about music. This person does not understand that when you are ignoring octaves, you don't, you're not talking about C in some particular octave. You are therefore also ignoring whether you're moving up by four and moving down by eight. And so <coughs> this was an extremely frustrating thing for me. Um, I got my papers published uh, when I did only through the intervention of sympathetic editors who sort of realized that I was actually trying to rethink one of these very basic ideas and that the, the reviewers were not being willing to engage in that level of rethinking. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting because the basic concepts here are absolutely simple, they're absolutely familiar in other fields, and I found that it was easy to explain them to music students, people your age, it was very hard to explain them to a 50-year-old person who has been thinking the other way for 35 years. Um, so maybe there's a, another interesting conversation to have there. <coughs>
Uh, so the interesting punchline is how do you represent the music theoretical concept of vector? And the answer is using the mathematical concept of vector. They are exactly the same. You don't need anything funny. You don't need anything new. The mathematical concept of a vector in the tangent space is precisely tool to making observations about a music theory. And you just have to sort of understand that this is so and, and be willing to sort of follow the connection uh, to its logical consequences. And you will find that if you do that, every elementary tonal theory books are chock full of descriptions of voice leading. Basic pedagogy is chock full of, uh, you know, tr I mean, basic instrumental technique teaches some of these voice leadings so you don't have to relearn them. You can well imagine basic composition teachers instructing beginning composers in these familiar loops from one chord to another. Okay, so having said that, I want to talk about what can you do with a formal theory of voice leading. And I want to focus on three things. Before we get to anything fancy like geometry, I want to talk about something sort of almost naive and simple, which is that once you have a theory of voice leading, once you have this object to theorize, you can count them. And this is actually fascinating. You can also, once you have voice leadings as an object of discussion, you can start to theorize them about them, meaning come up with interesting classes of voice leadings and um, look at how they're embodied in music. And finally, you can use this concept of voice leading or vector to define a genuine geometry of chords and chord types. So I'm going to briefly go through those and then leave some time for us to discuss. <coughs> Question one, how do you count voice leadings? Well, the first thing you need is a large number of musical scores in some computer re readable format. We're at a very exciting time because there is this new format called Music XML, which is a cross-platform text-based format for representing musical notation. And so suddenly, we are at a point where you can download large amounts of musical scores in a way that a computer program can read. There's a wonderful set of uh, extensions to the Python programming language um, written by my friend Mike Cuthbert that allow you to sort of read scores and process them and, and do statistics on them. Uh, doing this kind of work with music is actually hard because in order to get anywhere, the computer needs to know not just what notes are being played, but what key you are in, if any. So if you want to count voice leadings in a useful <coughs> way, you need to go through the, all of your music and identify chords by hand. Say, here we have a C major chord, and that is a tonic chord in the key of C major. And then you need to do a ton of programming. And once you do these three things, you can count voice leadings. And so this is something I've been doing for the last three or four I now have a corpus of um, uh, about a thousand pieces that I've analyzed by hand, each with about 120 chords in them. So it's a total of about 120,000 chords, stretching from Du Fai in about 1450, all the way up to Brahms. And actually, there's some good rock corpora. And I've got a grad student who's going to assemble an equivalent corpus for the sacred harp tradition of American folk polyphony. Um, so here, I, you can see I've analyzed all the Bach chorales, and so that's like 12,000 chords in major and about 9,000 chords in minor. This represents a substantial amount of work. Uh, I've done all the Mozart piano sonatas, about a third of the Beethoven piano sonatas. With, lots of people have helped me with this. Um, two and a half books of Monteverdi madrigals, seven Palestrina masses, uh, every uh, Ionian mode Josquin piece that is Sort of well attributed to him. So we can actually, one of my, my goals here is to try to understand how uh, functional harmony developed uh, uh, over the centuries. But we can also get really, really, really detailed, interesting uh, data about particular composers' practice and the evolution of that practice. And so let me show you the kinds of things <coughs> that I am interested in. Here's a question. In the box style, does the tritone in the seventh uh, diminished first inversion going to one progression, does that tritone tend to resolve? So we have this highly dissonant interval, and we're moving from this chord to that chord. And the question is, is this tritone under an obligation to resolve? 
And it happens that some of the most influential theory pedagogues tell you yes. And a lot of people say, really, the essence of functional harmony involves this interval resolving to this. Okay? So the question is, if you're moving from these upper voices to this chord, is this your default motion? Or is this your default motion? Theory books say this. What do you teach? Not to put you on the spot. You can say, I, 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 you can refuse to answer. Um, I actually allow either. Right. Okay. Well, the interesting thing is, instead of just like making up the answer, we can look at what actually happens in Bach's music, because I can count all the voice meetings and say, show me what Bach does. And I have a nice way of, of notating this. If we have more time, I can take you into my, my software and, um, uh, and, and show you how these things are represented. But it turns out that this is by far the most common thing that Bach does. So you're right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting, right? That here is a basic piece of information that is being taught to thousands and thousands of kids all across the country. And the leading textbook says, don't do this, do this. And that's just wrong, right? It's, it's just what it is, is absent this data, you have nothing to go on other than your own intuitions about what you think happens or what you think should happen. And it is scandalous what proportion of the uh, observations found in theory textbooks are just sort of reflections of what the author thinks should happen. So this kind of, this battle has been fought over grammar and style guides in the, in the realm of linguistics and writing teaching, and, and we're going to have a very similar set of arguments in music. Okay? So, turns out that this tritone actually, one of the whole points of this chord is that the tritone can move in all sorts of different ways, and it's not at all like the 5 7 chord where the tritone does have to resolve. Here's another question Is the 4 1 uh, progression quintessentially a neighboring progression? So there are a lot of people who say that when you're moving from the 4 chord to the 1 chord, these voices, these upper voices, have to move in a very stereotypical way. Scale degree 4 moves down to scale degree 3 by 1. Scale degree 6 moves down to scale degree uh, 5. And that the essence of the chord is a kind of moving back and forth from the tonic harmony to the subdominant harmony. And here, almost everybody has some version of this theory. So Dan Harrison, a friend of mine who teaches at Yale, this subdominantness for him is a function of these, these specific voice leading motions. This is essential to the Schenkerian picture of traditional harmony. And because of this, Schenkerians want to say that a 4-1 progression is not a true progression. It's merely neighboring motion. Okay, well, what's the other alternative? The other alternative here is a, a, a variety of other voice meetings, including ones where these upper voices ascend to the tonic scale degrees, which instead of involving neighboring motions, involves something, okay? Well, this is very interesting from a musical point of view, because traditionally we've been taught that the, F, the four chord and the five chord are fundamentally different. And the five chord involves leading tones resolving, and this tritone I was just talking about, resolving, and the four chord involves a totally different package of sounds and, and voice leading, leadings, and they're just, they're polar opposites. But what's very interesting about this four one progression is it actually contains a leading tone resolving to the tone within it, and it contains this resolving tritone, sometimes, not in this particular representation, but uh, often enough. conception of subdominantness that is highly contaminated with dominantness that cannot be strictly separated from a dominant tonic progression. The answer here is even more interesting than the previous one because it turns out that this concept of subdominantness is extremely common in Western music all the way up through and including Bach. Okay? But after that it disappears. So you can look long and hard 
for this kind of progression in Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, and not find it. This concept of, of how the four chord moves to the one chord uh, has been exterminated by the time you get from by the time you get from early <coughs> functional harmonic music, the music of Corelli and Bach, to the classical era that that sort of typifies that style for us. Meanwhile, this kind of treatment of the four chord is something that Bach shares with composers who are not thought of as tonal composers, composers like Monteverdi, like Thomas Morley, like Palestrina, right? So what's really interesting here is once you have quantitative data, which is itself made possible by having a formalism that allows you to actually identify and count voice leadings, you start to see that some of the basic truisms of, of the potted histories that we teach our students are not right. There's a substantial difference between the vocabulary of the early Baroque and the vocabulary of the classical period. There are actually huge continuities between early Baroque treatment of uh, some of these functional chords and what we think of as late Renaissance, non-functional, modal music. So one of the things I'm interested in is retelling this story so that, first of all, we can give actually accurate information to students, and second of all, so we can see uh, a much more continuous picture of how music evolved such that it becomes possible to talk about functional and tonal elements in Palestrina's music and also, we can talk about the continuing evolution of the language as you go from, say, 1720 to 1820. Okay? So, I can talk about counting voice leadings forever. I'm not going to do that. Those are my two examples of things that you can get from having a theory of voice leading long before you get to anything fancy like geometry. The next thing I want to do is talk about how, once you have the concept of a voice leading as an object, you can actually do some interesting theory just with that concept. So I want to introduce you to a concept uh, called the canonic voice leading. Now, the idea of a canonic voice leading should seem a little paradoxical because a canon is something that is extended in time. It's a melody that can be layered on itself harmoniously. A voice leading, okay, that maybe connects two musical instances, instance, this chord and that chord, but it's hard to see how a voice leading could be by itself uh, essentially canonic. Okay, so I'm now going to define for you what I mean by a canonic voice leading. A canonic voice leading has to satisfy two properties. Number one, it has to connect chords that are related by transposition. Here we have a major chord with double third, and we start with a major chord with double third, and we end with a major chord with double third. So we end in a place that is analogous to the place we started. That is property number one. Property number two is that the voice leading acts as a cycle on the voices. Meaning, if we label the notes of this first chord by their function, say, root, first third, second third, fifth. Then we can label the notes of this chord, first third, fifth, root, second third such that the voice leading sends one to two, sends two to four, sends four to three, and then sends three back to one. Meaning, we can iterate this thing. Just keep doing it. We can iterate it because we ended up in the same place that we started. That's property one. Property two is, if we iterate it, each of the voices cycles through each of the functional elements of the chord, and they end up playing the same melody. Okay, is that clear why that would sort of happen? Okay. Sorry, yeah. could you maybe trace one of the numbers and Okay, so root yeah. will go to two. Okay. One to two. Now we transpose everything by fifths. So now this G sharp is over here. <laughs> okay. There's a G sharp now. And it will go down by two. Actually, you know what? Let me give you my next slide. Because I actually have the can in this thing. So here's what happens if you iterate this voice leading. Okay? So here is the first element instance of the voice leading. Okay, we've got D, F sharp, F sharp, A. Okay? Let me just actually, I'll play you the whole canon, and then I'll talk you through it. 
Okay, so you can kind of hear each voice is doing some version of this melody. And then... And then... Okay, so if you take it starting from... <coughs> Starting from here, root D goes to the lower third F sharp, which then goes to the I mean the two sorry C sharp the two thirds you you have freedom there to to, to declare which one is the first or the lower or which one is the second or the higher that's totally an arbitrary thing that the composer can can project onto the music so root goes to third <coughs> C sharp now we're going up to E C sharp goes to fifth, which then, now we go to B minor, which goes to the third, and then we end up back with the root, okay? Here, root goes to third, goes to fifth, goes to third, goes to, no, I'm sorry, that's not right. Uh, this is fifth, goes to third, goes to root, goes to third, goes to fifth. Okay, so, you'll just, I mean, I'm going to have to ask you that to take my word for it that if you sat down and looked at this for here, I'll make you this deal. Write this down on a piece of paper. This right here. And if after 15 minutes of thinking about it you still don't get it, email me and then I will answer any questions that you have. Or if it's going to take you A, C sharp, C sharp, E goes to G sharp, E, E, G sharp. One, two, three, four, two, four, one, three. Those are your crucial pieces of information. You will be able to figure it out. Okay, here's an instance of the canon that is generated by just taking this voice theme and doing it over and over and over again. While I was analyzing all 371 Bach Barats by hand, because I'm that kind of guy, um, I was proofreading and I was looking for one progression and I found this place and I started looking at this Bach Thorell. I said, oh, that's funny. It's almost like he does this one voice thing two times in a row. And then I thought, oh my gosh, there's a kind of, I found a canon buried in the end of this one Bach Thorell, this beautiful hidden structure. It's a little bit like if you're in some Renaissance palace and you're in the bathroom and you know, you look behind, I guess they didn't have toilets, but whatever sort of pre-toilet conveniences they had, you look somewhere where no one would look and you find this little masterpiece <coughs> of Renaissance painting sitting there where no one would ever look. Or I guess the, uh, the top of the Milan Cathedral is a good real life uh, uh, example of this where you have these beautiful sculptures that no one would ever see. So here is an underlying canon at the top. Here at the bottom, I transform the canon slightly. Oh, actually, you have the score. I can do that. We'll get to the score in a second. Here, I transform the canon slightly. For instance, you, I slow it down. So this, okay, we start with. That's the canon exactly as it should be. Now, what should happen is that. Um, the top two voices should move together up. But what happens is I let the, the alto voice move up first. And then have the soprano voice move up second. And then I continue this slowing down process. This should be an eighth note long, it's a quarter note long. So this is the same pattern as this, only it's been slowed down a little bit. Then, if you trade the two voices, if you allow the soprano and tenor to trade, and then you make an additional swap here, you get exactly the end of this Bach chorale. Okay, so this Bach, it turns out that this canonic voice leading that I'm talking about is one of Bach's favorite contrapuntal tricks. And he does it all the time. It just <coughs> lay under his hands when he's here. He just kind of lets his fingers go through this pattern that he clearly internalized. And so in this music is buried this little canon in a way that you would never, never notice unless you're some kind of weird maniac like me or maybe Bach.
think, here's box music. <laughs> Now, there are a few things that are astonishing about this. One is he realized he could take this harmonic pattern and iterate it in such a way as to create this sort of broken symmetry, this hidden canon, given a melody that was not box. He just had this melody to work with and realized, I think he started with this pattern, iterated it once, realized he could kind of keep going by switching things around, even though the melody was doing you know, not, even though the melody was not under his control, and he just did it. I will report to you that, okay, I understand if there was just one instance of this canon buried in Bach's music, uh, I could see one making a case that this was entirely coincidental. It turns out there's a ton of them, and Bach did this all the time, and there are other examples that are this long or longer. And so one nice thing is we can say, okay, this canonic voice leading concept this was something that was part of Bach's practice in a hidden way. Okay, uh, I have another example here. Uh, if you look, actually, so this canonic voice leading generates this melody. If you look on the handout I gave you, <laughs> there's a related voice leading that is only three notes long. That is. find it in this Marenzio uh, madrigal. The madrigal is sung by a, uh, by a young lover to his departed beloved. She's dead. And this happens at the time he says, you have gone where I cannot follow. And it's the only canonic moment in the madrigal. So, uh, so the musical canon is being used as a representation for chasing or following. And the inability to chase or follow is being associated with mortality. And so it's this funny thing where the music is demonstrating exactly what cannot be. And so this is another one of those canonic voice leadings that's a three voice pattern. And if you take this home and look at it, you realize Morenzio is doing something kind of cool, which is you realize the melody can be set against itself in two separate ways, and that allows him to avoid a forbidden 6-4. So I recently actually wrote a piece of music <laughs> called I Cannot Follow that is based on this association of canon and uh, mortality and, and, and some plays with some of these patterns, but in a in more 20, 21st century harmonic context that is sort of triadic. And for me, that is a really exciting sort of way of approaching this material. You use theory to teach you something interesting about the music of the past and then help you generalize that, and then that becomes the input to, uh, <coughs> to something creative, where you feel like you're part of a musical conversation that stretches back four or five hundred years. Okay, um, you know, I'm gonna skip, I have another nice thing to talk about with voice leadings. There's a stride piano pattern here, which is kind of interesting. This is a basic <coughs> thing that jazz pianists do with their left hand. It's sort of interesting because it involves some of the notes moving down by semitone and others of the notes moving down by fifth. So it combines interval cycles in a way where you get the same chord every time. So it's kind of like some people are taking tiny little steps, some voices are taking tiny, big gigantic steps, and they always end up in synchrony with each other, which really shouldn't work out right. These different motions should cause sort of dissonances and crashes and collisions. Um, I could take you through a whole narrative where I generalize this basic uh, property. I show you what is it about the chord. It turns out the presence of a nearly even part of the chord. Uh, and so we could learn about how this works. And then I have these beautiful examples from the Rite of Spring where Stravinsky plays with this in using two different kinds of chords. He does it once in the da Dance of the Adolescents, and he does it once in the Procession of the Sage. So again, you can figure out that Stravinsky is playing a little game with the notes that you know, I don't think anybody has really noticed before. And then I can actually connect this to some of the top stuff I'll talk about uh, in Jody's class tomorrow about rock harmony and this sort of odd chord progression. But I'm gonna skip that and get to the end of the story, uh, which is that once you have the notion of a vector or a voice leading 
use that to generate a robust <coughs> geometry of musical objects. Um, and it turns out that there's this beautiful translation manual where the metaphors I introduced at the beginning of the talk, uh, where chord was associated with a point in some kind of space, these met metaphors can be made perfectly concrete and rigorous and non-metaphorical. So chord really can be associated with a point in an orbital. A voice leading can be associated with a vector or a path in a space. And a musical scale, like the C major scale, can be associated with what people call a metric, a way of measuring distance. It's something that teaches you uh, what one means, one scale step. Okay? And so the really beautiful thing here is that this translation manual is fairly idiomatic on both sides, meaning you don't have to warp or transform what musicians are talking about when they're talking about chord scales or voice leading. And similarly, you don't have to warp or transform what mathematicians are talking about when they're talking about points and orbitals, vectors or paths metrics, tangent spaces, and so on. It really turns out that these two languages are equivalent in some very deep sense. They are the same ways of, or they are different ways of talking about the same fundamental uh, uh, phenomena. And in doing this work, it's really useful to follow what I call the golden rule, which is that every point represents a chord, and every line segment represents a voice And if you've got that in your mind, which means which is only possible if you have a theory of voice leading, then uh, you can really just sort of turn the crank and figure out how to go back and forth between these two musical worlds. And this is really only possible if you have a good, robust uh, um, understanding of voice leading. Now, one way of seeing this, it's not in the book, it should be in the book. When I teach this to undergraduates, I always start by getting them to tell me all the different kinds of two-note intervals there are. You know, and it's really easy to get them to come up with this figure. They say, oh, there's the unison, there's the semitone, there's the major second, there's the minor third, there's the major third, there's the perfect fourth, there's the tritone, and the perfect fifth is just the same as the perfect fourth. And so it's really easy for undergraduates to come up with this simple diagram of what theorists call two-note interval classes or two-note set classes. And you can sort of put this on the board and you can actually look at voice meetings. You can write out two note passages, two voice passages of music, and you can get the students to plot these voice leadings on this space. And they notice that voice leadings seem to bounce off the points on either end, and so that those points act as if they were mirrors. And you can sort of teach them about the geometrical concept of singularities in that way. And then you can get them to say, well, wait a minute, suppose you want it to distinguish all the different major thirds. You want to add transposition into this picture. How do you do that? And it takes the undergrads about five minutes, but soon someone says, well, imagine if transposition, like, okay, here the, here's the major third is this point. Maybe the different major thirds involve going in a different direction. And you say, right. <coughs> and if you go in that direction far enough, where do you end up? And they say, well, back where you started. So you can sort of imagine that there's a circle coming off of each of these points. And the undergrads do basically great with that. And then you can get to this point and you say, well, what is unique about the circle representing the tritone? And the undergrads think for a little bit. And they say, well, that circle needs to be half as long as the other circles. And you say, good, good, good. And is there any way to make that circle half as long? And eventually, someone will come up with the idea of taking the space, flipping it around so that the two copies of the space share this tritone, and then from there, you can easily generate the geometry of two note chords, which is a Mobius strip, which has that uh, basic <coughs> representation of the different kinds of intervals as half of its cross section. And in this space, voice leadings really are vectors or paths, and they show all the familiar geometrical puzzles of this, including, you know, when you, if you move a vector from one place to another place, how you move the vector determines where it ends up pointing. I'm not going to go over this very carefully, very, in very um, much detail. What can you do with this geometry? Well, one cool thing is you can build sculptures and other artworks. And so if you're ever in Manhattan, you can go to the Museum of Mathematics. This is the geometry of three note chord types. Yeah, each one of the, each ball, like one of these balls is the major chord, one is the minor chord, 
one is the augmented triad. Any three <coughs> chord type you can play is on this sculpture. Uh, the sculpture, each of these balls in the actual thing is a theremin, so you can actually touch it, and then the sculpture plays the chord that you're touching, and also plays it as a rhythm. And so there's a whole world of sort of moving between what dancers do or, or what sculptural objects look like and, and musical representations. Uh, in my book, I talk about how we can use the framework to answer basic theoretical questions about the nature of music. For instance, how can we combine similar harmonies and small voice leadings? Uh, we can understand the logic behind specific pieces. That's basically what the second half of my book is about. Pieces like Chopin's E minor prelude or Debussy's Le Joyeuse. We can understand the origin of many seemingly independent graphical depictions of musical sculpt structure. So there's a lot of practical and sort of artistic benefit from this geometrical way of thinking. But, you know, as I've thought about this more and more, I also think that, you know, these things are excuses. And at the end of the day, this connection between the world of geometry and the world of music is intrinsically beautiful. And just like mathematicians, I don't think, should always be in the position of having to answer the question, why is transfinite set theory worth doing? Uh, you know, or, or musicians shouldn't really be in the business of answering the question, why is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony worth studying? Well, part of what humans do uh, is to understand and appreciate beautiful things. And so I sort of, the more I think about <coughs> this connection, the more I default to, um, to the, the answer, you know, this connection really is intellectually beautiful in a very deep sense. And if you don't think so, you're missing out on, 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 on something that's really wonderful. And that's okay, you know, not all of us can appreciate all of the wonderful, beautiful things in the world. But uh, I think that getting too utilitarian too soon is a mistake, okay? Uh, and what I'm really interested in is understanding how composers' choices are constrained by this pre-existing logico-geometrical structure of musical possibility. So, what can you do with the robust formal theory of voice leadings? You can count them. We saw how to do that with the seven and six progression, the tonal tritone and the four one progression. Theorize about them, we do that with common voice leadings. We can use this idea to define the true geometry of chords and chord types. And so, thanks. Okay, so questions about stuff or about transdisciplinarity as a way of life or anything else? Yes? Um, can you talk a little bit about the software that you use? Okay, so um, I use two pieces of software for the uh, for visualizing music <coughs> and for interactive stuff. I use something called Max MSP, which is a um, composition software, but it has hooks into OpenGL, and so you can do 3D graphics. And all the pictures in my book are generated with <coughs> OpenGL, Open, OpenGL that I'm interfacing through Max MSP um, for doing. Uh, uh, statistical analysis of individual scores, I use something called Python, and uh, augmented with um, Music 21 is the name of the, uh, the software. That basically just gives you, you know, you don't want to write something that, that reads a music, a music XML file. So it does all of that junk for you. you know, and then you can go through and say, okay, uh, you, you, can, you can spend your programming time on the stuff that's individual to your project. At this point in time, what is being played? This kind of thing only works, like I said, there, this is not a programming language, but uh, along the way I developed a, um, a format for doing Roman numeral analysis um, <coughs> in a way that a computer could read. So for all of my thousand files, oops, I've gone through them, so here's the first Bach chorale, and I have a little language that says, here's what key you're in, here's what chord you're in, right? And it deals with all sorts of things like pivot chords, and strange altered chords, and so on. The cool thing about Music 21, from my point of view, is that uh, Mike wrote a module that reads all of this stuff in. <coughs> so that allows 
that, so basically all of my statistical stuff combines a score, and he's written the software for reading the score and manipulating it, with an analysis of the score, and he's written the software that, that speaks my analysis language. And so then you can do things like, you know, label all the non-harmonic tones. Well, it knows what chord it is, it, it can figure out whether it's a passive tone or a neighboring chord. The wonderful thing about Music 21 is it speaks to you by giving you a score, or you can tell it to give you a score. So in other words, rewrite box, all of box corrals with the non-harmonic tones labeled and the chords identified underneath, or remove all the non-harmonic tones and replace them with the harmonic tones that they stand for, and then go look for all the parallel fifths that have been disguised in the real music. The ones that are, that are revealed when you remove them. So the sky is really the limit with that kind of thing. And I think we're only, I haven't done the obvious stuff. More questions? Second question? Yes? Um, I have a question about uh, more of the geometric interpretation sure. of yeah. music, and especially with um, <coughs> this idea of paths on the musical pitch space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they actually, I mean, I don't know if you answered this. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you answered this in the presentation or if you right. answered this elsewhere. In the right. Right. right, But just in, there seems to be an ambiguity with uh, the distance between different points on the pitch space, especially with uh, different poisons of the piece, or if you're in the reduced pitch space. I know in your 2006 paper you talked about uh, the end torus mod permutations. Yeah. You know, so if... Well, the 2006 paper, I was actually being... I backed off the 2006 paper doesn't have paths and pitch class space in it. Right. It should, but I didn't. I, I partly because there was there's so much resistance to it. Uh, I just I kind of got cold feet and didn't. Really <coughs> it. I wish I did in retrospect. Um, it's in the 2008 paper. Uh, um, so I, I, I'm not sure I understand the ambiguity. But uh, okay, in a in a on the circle. There are multiple paths between two points, and the distance is the length of the smallest. That's that's sort of if you've oh, got okay. a length space, that's that's how things work on the Earth. Okay. Right, look, right, right. The distance between here and your home, there's a ton of paths on the Earth that get between those two points. But when you're talking about the distance, you're talking about the length of the shortest of those. Oh, paths. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to get. Yeah, at. So that, no, it's that so, simple. So when you okay, so when you interpret paths on the pitch space, you're taking the shortest distance. Distance is the length of the shortest path. Right. And that's there's a mathematical name. It's called a length space. Basically, you know, mathematicians have worked this out, and and, and there you can construct. Like, mathematicians have done everything, so you can construct bizarre spaces where the distance is not associated with the length of the shortest path between the spaces. But fortunately, in these musical cases, typically you're only dealing with the, the sort of simplest, most basic kind of way of thinking. You don't have to address the mathematicians. <coughs> So yeah, yeah. Distance equals length of shortest path. As a general. Okay, and that's regardless of the voicings. Mm -hmm. Right? Because in the reduced I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking like if you have the end torus versus yep. the end torus mod permutation. Sorry this isn't accessible for some people. My my training is mathematical. Yes, go ahead, yes. So if you're if you're dealing like in the end torus, that gives rise to Basically, you're you're looking at different voicings. Yeah. You know, say if you have yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So if you have like a fugue or a quartet. Yeah. You know you can look at you know the paths in the end torus versus in the torus mod permutations. So right. If you have so like, okay, if you go to the covering space, the the distance between it's just the lift of the thing that's in in the quotient, right? So right. so okay, you got C major and F major. The quotient has all sorts of paths between C major and F major. <laughs> The shortest of those is the distance between those two points. You just look at the lift in the covering space, Rn, and anything, any two points that are connected by a path that is a lift of the of the shortest path in the quotient is those are at that appropriate distance in the covering space. So, okay. so the quotient and the lift is is isometric in a nice way. So everything just you can go back and forth. Okay. So what do you write? In the covering space, you'll have a voicing of C major and a voicing of F major that's totally <laughs> far away and not connected by any path of that's the length equal to the distance. But there will be an alternative representation of C major that's close to that F major, and the path connecting them will descend to the shortest path. Okay. So it's, it's all just like, just like you would hope. 
Okay. Next, sorry, guys. Uh, any other questions? About it? Yes. <coughs> what we were talking about, just sort of the, the you know, analogy between the music language and the mathematical language, when you talked about scale, yeah. I, I immediately went to fractals and then thinking about scale three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things. And can you, can you talk about it? If you encountered that or studied it? Well, so there is a sort of little fractal thing. I mean, here I'm really talking, scale, it's really a metric. So one of the funny things about all the spaces I'm talking about is they're spaces <laughs> that come from taking a copy of pitch space and gluing together a bunch of copies of that. And that actually creates a special mathematical situation because the space has a little more structure than just a generic space. So the scale really gives you a metric on this underlying circle. The scale is a metric on the pitch class. Now in terms of the fractal idea of, of so nothing in music is truly fractal or truly scale free in the sense that you, know, you can zoom out in an arbitrary way and, and just, you know, music exists in time, and for anything to have that level of structure, it would have to be sort of too long, or, or we don't have, we don't have the ability to have many, many, many representations of the same fundamental structure at different hierarchical levels in music. There is, however, in my book, I really talk about um, maybe the first baby step toward that fractal picture, which is, and this I find to be perfectly sufficiently beautiful and wonderful, which is that the procedures you find at the level of the scale, like efficient voice labor, get replicated at the, sorry, at the level of the chord. The procedures you find at the level of the chord, like efficient voice labor, get replicated at the level of the scale, where you find composers improvising in a scalar space like this, which then moves via something very much like efficient voice meaning to a different scale. So you have chords connected to chords efficiently in doing their thing. Meanwhile, all of those chords are subsumed in a higher level object, scale, a scale which can be connected to another scale by efficient voice meaning. And in fact, you can find beautiful specific analogs between these two structures such that you can literally replicate the voice leadings at the chord level at the scalar level. So it's not fractal because it's only two hierarchical levels. On the other hand, it's cool, right? And the same basic tools can be moved back and forth. And so you can say things like Debussy was doing with scales the very sort of thing that Chopin and Wagner were doing with chords. And I find that to be really neat, even though um, yeah, okay. Maybe we could go a third level, but I think that eventually, you know, it would take like 30 years <laughs> to have, a, your piece would be 30 years long, you know, and that's just not going to, that's not going to fly. We're sort of out of time, but it's 3.05, so. I just yeah. wanted to mention, just as a, as a side note, because you mentioned that 30-year-long piece, you know, yeah. that, that organ piece by John Cage. The, yeah. That's right. I think it's going on right now for yes. just about 100 years or so. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. So, right, you can do that. Um, eventually, you're going to get to like music composed by computers that can only be perceived by computers. I mean, I sometimes think of the fun, there are real fundamental facts about music is constrained by scale. And when you try to think of a sonata form where the exposition is three hours long, and you realize that's only like an order of magnitude longer than a genuine sonata exposition, but you just can't sit in a single key for an hour and a half without engendering severe boredom, right? So I do think that music is constrained in the dimension of time uh, in all sorts of ways that, that impose kind of limits on what people are ordinarily prepared to accept. Okay? Can yes. I ask just a final question? Sure. Very general I'm happy to stay. I just don't want yeah. anyone wasting their terrible Sunday afternoon listening to, to me. So, so you guys can keep asking questions. I just don't, don't. Yeah, I think just to, in closing, I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit about disciplines. And you mentioned the idea that American music theory is connected to this fact that yeah. um, there were composers <coughs> who were working with the 12-ton technique. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're a composer, too. And, right. and in some ways, you're doing some of the, some of the similar kinds of things. And I'm yeah. interested to hear your thoughts about music theory, mathematics, composition, right. how these things relate to you in the contemporary context. Right, right. Well, that's a very generous question. Um, uh, so I'm actually pretty unusual. I would say among composers of my generation and younger, uh, music theory got tarred 
basically with an association with atonality, with cerebralness. With, so basically when people decided they didn't want to write atonal music anymore, they kind of also decided that theory was part of the problem. So people went to a much more intuitive approach. And so I know, I mean, a lot of the younger composers I teach are, are you know, people in my generation or friends who are younger, they, they really are sort of flying by the seat of their pants in a way, just kind of, they're very intuitive. Sometimes to the extent that they don't even study scores, they're not interested in even looking at the total composer like Shostakovich or Ernest Stransky, figuring out what they're doing. So I do, I am a kind of anomaly in that, you know, I was trained by Milton Babbitt, David Lewis, and these cerebral and tonal guys. I naturally am interested in theory. I, I, I like looking at the scores and figuring out how they work. Um, and interested in thinking about how those kinds of ideas, those ideas in general really help me feel like I can take materials from the old traditions and and make them meaningful, right? So instead of Wagner just having, okay, I used to think, oh, that's just a chord progression, you know? I don't know, that's just those specific notes. And now I think of it as an instance of a more general procedure of kind of efficient voice giving. And so that makes it fresh and interesting and also gives me ways to use that, maybe not those chords or those specific notes, but that kind of idea as, as something I can do something with. So, so part of what I would like to do is, is uh, make the case that theory ideas can help us understand uh, musical structure in ways that still allow intuition to operate. Um, and, and in a way, a lot of the music I look at, one of the things I like most is looking at the music of very intuitive composers like Debussy or Chopin, and say, look, there's, there's, a, there's structure, there's intuitive aspects to it, but underneath it, there's rigor that's as deeply rigorous as the more, I would say, artificial <laughs> rigor of the 12th composers that we've talked about. So. Okay, well, we should have food just outside so we can continue the conversation. Yeah. But thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Thanks. Yeah. For Yeah, I'm very accessible, so if you want to ask questions out there, feel free. If you're too shy, you can email me. My email is Dimitri at Princeton, so it's not that hard to find.